and I will praise you, O oh, my Redeemer. I will praise you, O oh, my Redeemer, for you are worthy. Let me just say this, uh, if you're in the room, if you're in the sanctuary here, you can be seated, you can grab a seat. Those of you who are joining us from home or out under the canopy, if you're out under the canopy and you're live streaming there and you're comfortable in terms of being around some other people, but you're out there and you're freezing because it's cold, you are more than welcome to come on inside, there's plenty of space for you. Uh, those of you who are at home, we're glad that you've joined us. And for everybody, we've got a couple of announcements, a couple of things to walk through. First and foremost, man, it is so nice not only to be seen by a lot of you, and what I mean by that is it's so great that you guys are being faithful to tune in to the live stream and hear from God and to sing to the Lord and to pray. Those things are really great. But if you're here in the sanctuary, which is a weird thing to say because obviously you're here in the sanctuary, those of you here in the sanctuary that have signed up, that have come for this 1030 service, we are so glad you are here. Um, the smiles and the interaction that's happening on everybody's faces is a, is a fantastic thing, and we're glad that you've uh, decided to come and to begin to resume services together. We do know this, so everybody's aware, 
Jackson County is in phase two of the state's uh, plan to get people back together. And what that means for us as a church is we have a lot of options available to us at this point. And so we want to let you know, both here and out there, uh, we just want to let you know that you... Um, you want to check the website on a regular basis. If you're not familiar where the church uh, website is, I, I encourage you, go to Google. Uh, just look, Rogue, look up Rogue Valley Christian Church. Go to the website. Tomorrow we'll have an update link on what's happening and what we're doing for our services in the coming future, in the next few weeks. And just so you know... Um, what that means is this, we're going to continue to offer multiple options at multiple different times. Uh, those of you that are home live streaming, if you're still feeling more comfortable at home, we want to let you know we're going to continue live streaming every Sunday at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. And we're going to go real-time live. We're, we're, we're not re pre-recording anything, uh, mostly because we don't have the manpower to edit anything. We're just going to go live and be together in that way every service every Sunday morning, 9 o'clock and 10.30. Just so you know, we are also going live at on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock for a more of a Bible study, uh, more of a theological look on uh, relevant topics. So that's hell happening, and so those options are available. Um, but we're also on Sunday mornings providing a 9 o'clock service in the sanctuary for those who are interested, and that service is mask required. Once we put out our survey, we started to recognize that or there were people who felt nervous about such things, and we wanted to make them feel comfortable, and we wanted to provide a loving space for them. And that's a good thing for us to remember, right? I know that we're in a, in a season of doing church that is different than we've ever done it before, and I promise you this, no matter what our plans are, no matter what our, what our procedures are in game plans, we are probably not going to be able to make every single person perfectly happy. I would suggest to you it's probably not our job anyway. It's the Lord's. We'll get to that in a minute. However, we're doing our best. If you want to know what's guiding our principles and our practices through all of this, it is God's love and the ability to love one another, the ability to love our neighbor even as ourselves. And so at nine o'clock, the loving thing to do for people around us is to wear a mask and it's not so much to protect me, but it's to protect them from what might be around them. So 9 o'clock Sunday morning in the sanctuary, mask required. We also have 9 o'clock outside. We trust that the weather is going to get better. We have a 9 o'clock live stream outside underneath the canopy. There's plenty of spaces out there. That's a ma mask recommended. And then at 1030, obviously right now we have a service in the sanctuary. Masks are not required, but are recommended. And then we also have a 1030 live stream underneath the canopy outside mask recommended. So just so you know, we're going to continue to provide all of those options just with bigger availability. We'll be able to accommodate more people. So be looking at the website, be checking your email, be looking on YouTube because we're going to put some videos out next week that are going to explain what that all looks like in the coming weeks. And we're all pretty excited. With the phase two guidelines, here at this church, we have lots of options that can accommodate a lot of ministry, and we're pretty excited about that. Don't forget, Wednesday night is not only just a live stream at 6 o'clock, but it's also in person at 6 for anybody who wants to join us in the sanctuary. It's a mask recommended. But at 6 o'clock, if, uh, you know, if you don't have anything else going on or you eat an early dinner, you can come on in and join us for Bible study in here. Last Wednesday, we had a small group here, and it was awesome as we look at the word that way. So that's what's going to be coming. Um, we also want to let you know, uh, for a bunch of people here, just so that we can have information to share to our small groups or the other people that we're in communication and connection with at the church, we're working through our guidelines and our plans for kids' ministry. Um, we're going to bring the, the kids back into services a little bit slower, and partly because we're trying to put together something that's going to not only keep the kids safe and use wisdom, but also uh, have the parents have, have, have a, a certain level of peace when they know that their kids are here and they're here in a safe environment. That being said... As Bethany and the crew is putting together some great plans and great procedures to, to, to kind of frame how that all works with nursery, elementary, and pre-K, 
um, we want you to recognize that a lot of our volunteers in the past have been from that portion of our population that is what, uh, what we would call a little bit higher risk. And so we've contacted many of them and many of our volunteers in that higher risk category are a little bit hesitant to come back and just start helping with kids now. And so what that presents for us as a church is an awesome opportunity for us to actually be the body of Christ, for us as parents to actually invest in the ministry that's investing in our kids. So here's the call. If you're a mom or a dad who has kids here and you want us to continue getting them back together and we want to, we're going to be able to do that sooner if we can get some volunteers during this season from our moms and our dads. If every mom or dad that, that has kids that go to church here kind of stepped in during this season, it wouldn't require much more than a once a month commitment to come in and, and volunteer at one of these services so that we can continue sharing the gospel with our kids. And so if you're in the room, we want you to be praying to that end. We want you to be praying for our parents that they say, well, we could help out there and I could help out there and that would be great. And it's a great loving and kind thing to do for the body. Um, at the same time, if you're out there and you're a mom and dad and you're waiting on that, don't forget every week Bethany's been preparing kids ministry packets that you can email her and she can get those to you via email. There's some great scriptures and coloring sheets and puzzles and games that you can do as a family that go right along with what we're talking about every Sunday. And that's going to continue. But we'd also love for you to be uh, willing to volunteer and help us out so that we can get our kids back in the building and we can start doing church as a family again. If you're willing to do that, I want you to go to our website and uh, contact Bethany through her email and just send her an email stating who you are and where you'd like to plug in to be able to help uh, provide a plan to get our kids back in their classes. Does that make sense for, for everyone? Uh, lest I'm forgetting anything, I, I, there's, there's going to be more information. We'll keep getting it out to you. In the meantime, we are still in the book of First John. So if you, got, if you have a Bible and you brought it, you can open it up to First John chapter 2. You could find verse 15. As you're doing that, let me remind you that as we've started to study 1 John, we've realized a number of things. One of the things that we've realized is that John was writing to his readers, those who would be hearing from him, those who would be paying attention to the words that he was writing. He was writing to them to remind them to walk in the light of God's love. He was writing to them to encourage them to keep walking in the light of God's love. And if you look at 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, over and over and over, you're going to see that, God, that John will use the language of light and darkness all the time. And he does so, I think, in a way that makes it easier for us to understand. Because it's an illustration that we get, isn't it? When we have light illuminating our way in the night, we can see where we're going. If we don't have light and it's dark out, we will end up tripping. And so John is actually writing to the people of God in Asia Minor, telling them that, hey, don't stop walking in the light of God's love. It will illuminate your way in each and every day. It will be for the believer that which reveals not only where to go, but how to get there and what to do when we're there. This is kind of why John is writing. But we've realized as we've been going through it over the last few weeks that the light of God's love is actually the key to our fellowship with the Father. It illuminates not our way just through the world, but it illuminates our way to God's heart and the reality of a right relationship with him. It also, the light of God's love, is also a safeguard against the darkness of sin. And again, if we're picking up on that illustration of light and darkness, if we're walking in darkness, don't you know that we cannot see clearly to avoid the sin issues that are around us all the time that want nothing more than to trip us up and to cause us to stumble and to fall. And thankfully, even as... John had proclaimed the light of God's love means that even when we stumble and fall, we can find forgiveness because of how and what Jesus has done for us. Last week, we were here and we were looking at this reality that the light of God's love is also, 
His love is also the intention for every single one of our interactions. And I would add this week, with anyone we may come across. Does that make sense? Like the love of God is supposed to not only reside within us, but it is supposed to be working through us as we interact with all kinds of people all around us. And when that happens, guess what? I believe with all of my heart, injustice gets fixed. Healing and help happens to people that are hurting and hopeless. People who are divided, the the divisions that we're seeing all around us in our world, people can actually be united by the power of God's love. Well, as we continue on, let's read 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. John says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you that your word is true and is truth for our lives. We pray, God, that you would help us to keep our eyes and our ears and especially our hearts and our minds open to what you would have to say to us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's an interesting thing. I don't know if you picked it up. But as we look at this passage, and as I've looked at it for weeks now, and this little few verses that starts with, do not love the world or the things of the world that are in the world, I start immediately, I start getting excited because it's my opportunity that comes around once in a while in the scriptures to rail and yell and to correct everybody who's doing all those bad worldly things. And I start getting super excited, start doing a little corrective dance, and I start getting like worked up and ready to pronounce judgment on all the bad worldly things that all you people are doing. I'm just kidding. That's actually not where my heart goes. I start looking at it and I'm like, well, wait a minute. Let's, what is, what, what's really going on here? I don't know about you, but if you recognize that John, who wrote 1 John, also wrote the Gospel of John. Are you with me? And in the Gospel of John, there's this pretty famous verse in chapter 3, verse 16, that says, for God so loves the world, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, right? But then in 1 John, years later, John writes, do not love the world or the things in the world. I don't know about you, but I can think, okay, did John just get old and grumpy and change his mind? Is John contradicting himself? And there are people that will say that. Like, look, the Bible contradicts itself. You can't trust it. And so that was my, did you guys get that? Right? Just so you know, it hurt my back. <laughs> so, so there are people that will say that. Or is there something else going on? And what's going on, and it's usually the case, is that we have to remember the Bible wasn't written in English. Amen? <laughs> and, 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 and this was written in Greek. And so when we recognize that, there are lots of different words to describe lots of different things that we narrow down into one English word. Does that make sense? Multiple Greek terms for the word world, but we just have the word world. And if we're not careful, we think he's talking to, you know, we think he's old and grumpy or he doesn't get that he's contradicting himself. He's not self-aware. But in reality, when John wrote that for God so loved the world, he was using a term for the world that indicated that he loved the people of the world. And in 1 John, when he says in verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world, He's using a term for the world that means a systematic uh, approach, outlook, or attitude, a worldview that is opposed to the ways of God. <clears throat> Does that make sense? A world. So when John says, don't love the world, he's not talking about people. 
He's talking about mindsets, attitudes, ideologies, and systematic ways of thinking that are inherently opposed to God that can affect us. And just so you know where all of those things come from, just so you know, they come from the enemy of God. They come from, for lack of a better term, Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, whatever it is that you want to call him. I just saw Dana Carvey on Saturday Night Live. I'm sorry. That's what flashed in my head. If you're not familiar with that, just trust me, do not Google it. So, right? This is what John is talking about. This this system, this mindset, if you will, that has made up its mind to stay opposed to the ways of God. This is what John is saying. Do not have anything to do with that. He's telling the people of God. And so one of the things that we can understand right off the bat is that This theme, this light of God's love, is it not only all those things that we also spoke of, but it is also a protection against, right, against the seduction of the world. And we're going to get into that. What's that mean? Does that mean this, that, or the other? Well, he gets into it. Look at what he says in verse 16. He says, for all that is in the world, he starts talking about that which hoodwinks people, that which seduces believers away from God. He says, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. He says, this is not from the Father, but is from the world. So I appreciate what John says. You'll appreciate it too, because what it's going to do, it's going to create riverbanks from which I will talk from, and I'm not going to just talk about all the bad things of the world that I think are bad. Instead, we're going to simply stay within the text. And we have to recognize that the light of God's love protects us against the sinful or seductive desires of our flesh. Does that make sense? Because when we start talking about our flesh, we're talking about that part of us, that part of us that doesn't want anything to do with God. It's an outlook that pursues its own ends in a in a self-sufficient and independent way apart from God. Does that make sense? It's not our fl- our spirit. It's our flesh that says, well, I want what I want, and I'm going to get what I want, and I don't care who says anything about it. That's the flesh. And we have to recognize that the light of God's love will actually protect us from being hoodwinked off the path by our flesh. If, if, if Instead of being seduced by our flesh, we should allow God's love to uh, bid us to come and die and find that I may truly live. Do you guys remember Mark chapter 8? I'll just tell you. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus is talking to some disciples. He's talking to people, and at this point, there are a lot of people that are walking with Jesus and wanting to be his followers. Don't forget he was considered a rabbi in that day, and a a follower was not just a a curiosity thing, but to be a follower of Jesus, uh, of him as the rabbi Jesus, would have meant you were committing to walk in his way. You were committing, if you will, to walk in the light of God's love in Jesus. You were committing to keep your eyes on Jesus, keep your ears open to Jesus, and do and go and say the things that he did, right? This is what it means to follow. And Jesus is talking to a group in Mark chapter 8, and in verse 34 he says, well, hang on. If anyone wishes to come after me, if anyone wishes to be my disciple, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. You see, the light of God's love in Jesus will protect us from the the nasty desire of our flesh that just wants everything apart from God. It will protect us because it actually makes us realize that the call of God to discipleship is a call to self-denial. It's a call to sacrifice. It's a call to humility in such that we walk with Jesus in that manner. And here's the cool thing and the good news in this. If we will allow the light of God's love to illuminate our way away from the flesh and into the spirit, right? If we will stop indulging the desires that want nothing to do with God, and instead we begin to feed the spirit that wants to worship and glorify God, guess what happens? We will find that our if we start living for the Savior, we actually become more of a blessing to the world around us, to the people around us. 
See, if we're just living to the desires of our flesh, then it's all just about us and our thing and our want and our deal and our stuff, right? And, and, and that kind of person, just so you know, is, is more of a burden or a bummer to the people around them, not a blessing. But if we live in such a way that we're living towards the Savior and we're feeding our spirit, we're committing ourselves to love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, guess what? Just so you know, even in the context of everything that's going on right now, just so you know, right now, I get excited for you guys and I get excited about the camera and there's just lots of overwhelming excitement going on here. Do you guys understand how weird it is to talk to you and them and them and you? This is a strange reality, but let the lesson be this. We're all just trying to do our part to see God's word and his gospel proclaimed and spread everywhere we can. But here's the deal. The world around us, the world around us, people, not perspectives, people. These are people that desperately are looking for and longing for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self Like This is what the world wants right now. They're enraged about all kinds of things right now. Lots of people are upset over all kinds of upsetting things right now, rightfully so. But even as I mentioned last Wednesday and last Sunday, if we, the people of God, will allow the light of God's love not only in our life but through our life, our way, our way will be illuminated through our world, that is, around people in such a way that we are a blessing on them, not a burden to them, that we actually bring refreshment to them and we don't just take from them. Does that make sense? So this is really, really important. The second thing he brings up, he says, not only all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, but he also brings up the desires of the eyes, the desires of the eyes. Just so you know, how do we, how do we describe what this is? Well, I wrote down this phrase. It is a greedy desire for things brought about by seeing them. Does that make sense? It's a greedy desire brought about or, or for things brought about by seeing those things. It's greedy glancing. Does that make sense? I was sharing this at the nine o'clock service. I am guilty of greedy glancing every single day I drive through the main street of town because down towards the mall, our town is riddled with car lots. And on those car lots, they always have the latest and greatest that I gotta get. Are you with me? And so, so they always, they always park them in such a way that I glance at them. Does that make sense? And if cars are not your thing, just imagine what your thing is, right? And I glance and I see these things and there's a part of me that's like, oh, that'll make me happy. Even though I know it won't. So let me stop for just a second, because you might be thinking, wait a minute, Darren, are you saying that it is sinful to even glance at those things? No, that's not what I'm saying. What's, what we're being warned of here in 1 John is greedy glancing. In other words, a glancing that says, I will do anything and run over anyone in order to have that in my life. This is a worldview and a mindset that John is saying, stay away from. You see, this is what it means. And instead of being seduced or hoodwinked by our greedy glances, we should allow God's love to fulfill every longing that we actually have in life. And isn't that the issue? I kind of exaggerate a bit. I recognize as I glance at this car and that latest and greatest and those running shoes and that golf club and that whatever it is, that shirt, those glasses, that watch, that shoe. Did I mention shoes? Like, as I glance at that stuff, I'm learning, even as I grow, and I bet most of us are, that they're actually temporal and they're not actually going to fulfill the real desire within my heart the real desire within my heart. And if we will actually stop 
looking to those things to fulfill us, then we can actually find life. Psalm chapter 37 verse 4 reminds us to delight ourselves in the Lord, knowing that he will give us the desires of our heart. And the desires of our heart, just so you know, go way beyond uh, things and stuffs, right? The desires of our heart are important things like uh, belonging and relationship and community and love and peace and hope. That's what our hearts desire, right? And I think all of us would probably admit that we probably looked to have those fulfilled in things that will never fulfill them. And it's time for us to actually look to the Lord. When we, when we are led by the light of God's love and we stop striving for these empty satisfaction and instead we trust that he can actually fulfill every desire we have within our hearts, then not only are we more of a blessing to people, but we actually become the conduits of God's blessing to people. Did you know that if we go back and look at the Gospels and we see everything that Jesus did when he lived, we read of the things that he said that brought life to people. We read of the things that he did that brought life to people. We read of the cross and we read of his passion. Did you know that we... His disciples who have committed to a life of deny ourselves, right? Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. As we embrace that reality, that reality allows us to become the very vessels through whom God actually works in the world today towards the people today. So our lives become a conduit of Jesus' love for the people around us. And they get something significant, something eternal, as we have decided that our satisfaction, every soul's desire, is met in Jesus alone and only by God alone. Does that make sense? No new car, no new pair of shoes, no new watch, no new glasses, no new hairstyle, no new whatever it is that I struggle with or you struggle with or we struggle with. None of those things are going to satisfy our soul's longing, which is not only to see ourselves in a right relationship with God, but it's also to see people find hope and love and acceptance in God as well. That's the desire of our heart. I believe it's there. Now, maybe it's buried under layers and layers and layers of selfishness or greed or whatever it is, but it's there. And if we'll look to the Lord in that way, instead of just looking at stuff for, 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 for the way that it is, I do believe that God can work in that. Now, again, just so you know, I don't think shoes, cars, I just don't think these things are inherently wrong. I don't. I think that our relationship with them can be problematic if we're not careful. And this is what John is writing about. And this is why he's saying, allow the light of God's love, right? To protect you not only from the desires of your flesh, but even from the desires, that sinful desires of your eyes. He goes on, though, and he says one more thing. He says, not only the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes, but also the pride of life. These things are not from the Father, but they're from this world. The pride of life is this. It can be defined this way. Whatever status symbol that is important to us by which we define ourselves. Does that make sense? Whatever status symbol that is important to us that we define ourselves by. For some, it could be an education status symbol. For others, it could be a reputation status symbol that I'm known in my community this way, right? So not only am I the most important person in the room, but I'm also the smartest person in the room. I said this first service like I actually believe that, and people looked at me like, like they had a mask on, so they looked at me like this. I said, I was just kidding. And then they relaxed, and I said, well, kind of. I still have a problem with pride. Do you guys see where I just went? See, that's what pride does, and that's what these things do. Pride tries to convince us through our education that we're the smartest person in the room. Pride tries to convince us through a reputation that we're the most important person in the room. Pride tries to convince us through our stuff that we've accumulated more than anybody else in the room. Pride tries to tell us, right, 
that we are worthy of more praise and exaltation than anybody else in the room. But the problem is this. We've come to church, haven't we? Amen? Like in the sanctuary, right? Or even at your home. We've come to church. And we recognize in church that we must decrease so that he can increase, right? We come to church and we realize there's no place for pride. There's only a place for humility. Amen? And this is the problem, right? Pride tries to convince us of all of those things. And, the, and John, the apostle, is saying, be careful about that. Let my love illuminate your way around pride. Does that make sense? And if we look at the illumination of God's love as a way of showing our way, then we recognize his love illuminates the cross, doesn't it? His love highlights what he was willing to do for us, deny himself, take up his cross, and do everything that the Father said was required. Like his love as a guide, the light of his love guiding us through life will help us to avoid pride and actually embrace selfless sacrifice and humility to the point of giving God glory and honor. Instead of being seduced by our pride, we should allow God's love to cause us to brag and boast about all that he's done, not about the things that we've done. Does that make sense? Like, think this through for a minute. I don't know about you, but, well, you probably won't. Maybe you will. Follow me for a minute. I have a few minutes. I thought that was funny. <laughs> if you're at home, it's funny. And you can pause it and do whatever you want anyway, so we're fine. But if you think about that for a second, I will tell you this. I love Bible study. I've loved all the years that I continue putting in to trying to do research. This is going somewhere. I'm not bragging yet, but I'm about to. I love that whole process. And I recognize, just so you know, in the spirit that it has been a gift from God, that it's not everybody's reality, but somehow he graced me with it. And I appreciate it and I'm grateful for it. Amen? You guys are supposed to say, so are you. But that might just be my pride talking. So I'm grateful for that. But I also know that as a result of trying to think through things and write things down well and process well wherever I'm at, did you know that most of today's message came from standing in line at the bottle return place? <laughs> Do you guys know that you have to stand in line for hours now? <laughs> and I was standing there and I had all of these cans and bottles because it's my golf allowance. And I was standing there <laughs> and I'm standing there, I'm committed, right? Daddy's got to play some golf, but I can't just spend any money. I can only spend this money, right? And I'm standing there for hours, and I'm listening to some music, and then I realize, well, wait a minute, I'm going to be here a while. So I decided, well, I might as well take advantage of the tools that I have at my resource, and I might as well open up all the apps on my phone and start working and studying. And for two hours, it was fantastic. The time flew by. Before you know it, I had a receipt, and they gave me some golf money, right? And more than that, I had this message all the way planned out. And more than that, I went back and I read it through and I was like, man, that's some good Bible study. So then you fast forward to this morning and I'm reworking it at 5 a.m. thinking, man, that's not just good Bible study. That's real good Bible study. Are you now, do, you, do you see what's happened here? We tipped from humility to pride. It's going to go further. So... So I'm gonna, we're going to do this, and there'll be two real good Bible studies on the internet, and I'll be able to go home, and as I'm driving home, I'm going to have this challenge, because I'm going to go, I probably preached that better than anybody could have preached it at RVCC <laughs> at 930, who has a microphone. <laughs> do you see what I mean? This is what pride does. Pride makes you feel like a really big fish in a really small pond. Does that make sense? And I'm not saying that RVCC is a small pond. I'm just thinking it, it, it just tries to make us think we're a bigger deal than we really are, right? So I'm, I'm going to do that, and I'm going to buy into that, and I'm going to even go, oh, Lord, because I know I'm about to tell you that we shouldn't boast in anything except for Jesus Christ and the cross before us, right? I'm going to tell you that, Galatians chapter 6, 14. But before I tell you that, I'm going to be thinking, man, that's a good, I mean, that, that was a good Bible study. You write down the notes, I'll even email them to you. They're only written on paper, but you can, you can figure out my scratches. I'll get them to you. It's good Bible study. You can wow your small group with some good Bible study because I'm real good at this. I hope everybody at home can sense the irony, <laughs> right? 
So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to be like, oh, I'm real good at it. But I recognize that I'm supposed to give glory to God. So on the way home, I'm going to go, man, Lord, thank you for making me really good at this. <laughs> and for giving me a real good message. That I did my best to like, uh, did you see me, Lord? I was proclaiming and I was alive again. There are people that I, we were doing it, God. I was all in. And the Lord's going to go, hey, um, I'm going to go, yeah, 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 yeah. I proclaimed your word. And he goes, no, 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 no. I proclaimed life. Like my breath brings about something from nothing. Like I proclaim ex nihilo. Do you get of nothing. I, I bring about something from nothing. You brought about words from my word. <laughs> are, you, are, you, are you with me? <laughs> you see, the reality of life is that we should, and this is just my own personal experience, you take yours, and if you don't like my experience, don't watch this service back. <laughs> I would say get up and leave, but some of you are probably prone to do that, so please just stay here. <laughs> Whatever it is that causes us to have pride, we should always remember it pales by comparison to the things that God has done. Like, look, at, look, look, when we are led by the light of God's love, we stop needing recognition for what we've done. And I apologize for the silly illustration there. Lest you might think, oh, he just did that so he could even get, while well, talking about, he could manipulate us into giving him a little bit of recognition. No, I'm just trying to take a shot. Like, it's hard. This stuff is real, isn't it? But it frees us up from needing recognition for what we've done, and it allows us to start drawing attention to all that he's done. Because that's what's most important, isn't it? That's the stuff that will be long-lasting. The things that we do, whatever accomplishments that we have, and some of those are good accomplishments, right? But they're really not going to last forever, are they? Right? What's going to last forever, I, I mean, I recognize it next, next week. If we're being completely honest, I recognize it next week, even though we gave you a good Bible study. I recognize it next week. Some of you will come and go, what, what were you talking about last week? <laughs> I'm going to be like, wait, you didn't get the email of the good Bible study? You see what I mean? Like, it's here today and gone tomorrow. We just have to trust that the things of the Lord are eternal. That's what actually John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. He says, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. I'm going to invite you to turn over to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. And you might be thinking, wait, is he going to preach a whole other message? And the answer is no. Actually, I just want to draw our attention to something by way of application. Look at what Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, when John says, do not love the world or the things in the world, we have a choice to make. We have a choice to make this a Bible study about all the things we're not supposed to do. Or we can hear it for what I believe God intended it to be, and that would be an encouragement to do what we're supposed to do. And that is to make the love that we have, to make the light of God's love the treasure in our life. Because when the light of his love becomes our treasure, our heart follows. And where our heart follows, guess what happens? We then allow God's love to affect the things that are, the, 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 the battle that we have with our flesh. We allow the light of God's love to affect the struggle we have with what we see. We allow the light of God's love to affect the struggle that we have, this need to be recognized. The beauty about God's love is this. He gives us all the recognition that we could ever want. Not only does he know us. Remember, according to the Psalms, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And according to the Psalms, he knows even the numbers of hairs or not hairs on our head. According to the Psalms, he he knows every little bit about us, even our names. And according to the scriptures, he has called us his sons and daughters. 
right? So everything we want is found in him anyway. And if his love for us and the light of his love becomes our treasure, then our heart follows. And when our heart follows the Lord, guess what happens? Not only do we find satisfaction for our souls, but we become a blessing to the people that we come across everywhere and anywhere and all the time. If you're in the room, why don't you go ahead and stand with me for just a minute. The worship team's going to come back up. We're going to sing one last song together. If you're at home and you want to stand up, that's fantastic. If you want to just continue sitting on your couch and sipping your coffee, that's also wonderful. I will say this. As we wrap up this morning, just so you know, we're still working out all the details for how we do offerings and how we do communion. I would say this, as it relates to offering, there's still opportunities that you can give online, you can mail an offering in, you can drop it in the basket on your way out or drop it by the office during the week. I do want to recognize that God has been and continues to be unbelievably faithful to his church, this church, Rogue Valley Christian Church, even through this pandemic. God has been gracious and unbelievably faithful to provide for the ministry that happens here. And we recognize as a staff on a human level, level, we recognize that he does so through his people. And so thank you for being faithful, not just to the church, but most importantly to God's call in your life as it relates to supporting his work. As it relates to communion, just want you to know we're still working on a way to do that. If you recognize one thing in this world that we live in right now. Everything is kind of crazy and up in the air. And if you are doing any kind of safe communion supplies, they're all on back order. So they've been ordered and we're waiting for them to come. We will have those available not only in our at our in-service or in-person services, but we'll find a way if you need to make them available for you even at home as you continue to live stream if that's what you're comfortable with. But we just want to to know, like in here and out there, that take some time today and remember the reality of the cross. Because it's the reality of the cross that sheds the most light on his love, isn't it? And his love, as we think about it, not only is it the key to our relationship with God, and not only does it safeguard us against the darkness of sin, and not only is it the intention for all of our interactions, but it's also a protection against the world's seductions, against our own flesh and our own selfish desires and against our own selfish pride. His love, seen through the cross, (laughs) will bid us to come and die and find that I could actually truly live. As we sing this song, I want to encourage each one of us to symbolically, just symbolically, deep within our hearts, to symbolically be bowed down to the reality of who he is, committed to living according to the Spirit, committed to seeing the world around us the way he sees it, and trusting him to fulfill all of our desires in the meantime, committed to drawing more attention to him than we do ourselves. As we sing this song, let us be a people who are more committed to him than we are ourselves, and then trust that he'll take care of us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be together in it today, even in person and online. We pray that you would be honored and glorified as we think about it, as we embrace it, as we do our best to live it. God, we thank you for the gift of your love. Jesus, thank you for coming and dying as a perfect sacrifice that we might be forgiven, that we might be brought into, ushered into a right relationship with the Father. We are so thankful for this grace in which we stand. And we pray that you would be glorified even as we live our lives in the light of your love. Amen. Let's go ahead.